ka bacci ko kam wa ka ni star ko duba The Limpopo River forms an arc that separates present-day South Africa from Zimbabwe and Botswana. Within this arc lie extensive Quartzitic mountain ranges, long outcrops of sandstone kopjes, sand and gravel plains, and a mosaic of Mopani woodland dotted with giant baobabs. Human beings and their archaic ancestors have inhabited this ancient landscape with its rich plant and animal resources for hundreds of millennia. The peoples of the Late Stone Age, which began about 30,000 years ago, were the ancestors of the modern San or Bushmen hunter-gatherers, people who occupy the more arid regions of Botswana and Namibia today. For thousands of years, the Aboriginal San or Bushmen had this landscape to themselves. And then about 2,000 years ago, they were joined by Kwekwe or Khoikhoi herders, formerly called Hottentots. Then, black farmers began filtering southward, bringing with them their iron-making technology, ceramics, cattle and agricultural practices. Beginning about 1800 years ago, various farming peoples such as the Proto-Shona, the Mapungubu and Zimbabwe peoples, settled the region over a period of several hundred years. The Mapungubu peoples had commercial dealings with Arabs who had set up trading stations on the east coast of Africa. Ivory and gold was traded for beads, ceramics and other articles from the Middle and Far East. The capital of this trading empire was at Mapungubwe Hill in the Limpopo Shashi confluence area. Later, in about the 15th century, Sutu speaking people settled in the region. By the 18th century, many different groups in the Sokpinsberg were unified under the name Venda. The Limpopo River is called Vembe by the traditional Venda people. Vembe is said to mean the swallower because it is said to swallow people when they attempt to cross it in flood. Rudyard Kipling, who wrote eloquently of the glories of empire in Africa and India, described the river in more tranquil mood. The great grey-green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees. Early European travellers who began exploring the region in the early 19th century were intrigued and fascinated by this wild frontier region. They described the country as a veritable Garden of Eden, a description that befits the splendour of its landscapes. The semi-arid bushveld region of the Limpopo Valley is abruptly broken by the looming quartzites of a long mountain range. This great escarpment, which runs for 130 kilometers along the 23rd parallel, was given the name Zoutpansberg by early Dutch settlers. For here, a great salt pan is found. Some traditional Vendor peoples aptly call the Sokpansberg Range Rubwondo, the wall. Perhaps this Vendor name is the more appropriate one when one views the Sokpansberg from the south, 
where its great blue crances form a distinct barrier in the flat landscape. Toward the west lies the Mahabeng Plateau, a landscape of immense grandeur and beauty. Its base was formed from wind-blown desert sands about two billion years ago, and the tall spires of sandstone were formed by a succession of ancient rivers depositing their silts and pebbles over the ancient desert, followed by a process of slow erosion. This vast and ancient landscape was inhabited by various groups of people in the past, and certain groups left behind a rich cultural heritage in the form of rock engravings and paintings. Rock art sites occur in all the hill areas of northern Limpopo province. The Aboriginal owners of the land, the Bushmen, believed in two deities, a great god who lived in the eastern sky, and a lesser god, the trickster, who had his home in the western sky. Like the bushmen of the Kalahari, the hunter-gatherers who once occupied northern South Africa may have had stories about the origins of the landscape. A Kalahari bushman folktale, for example, recounts how the mythical trickster god was walking in the bush when he saw a puff adder who was sleeping in a hole in the sand with her young. He thought that he would play a trick on her, so he jumped over the hole and defecated into it. He did this over and over again. At last, the puff adder lost patience with this game and decided to teach the trickster a lesson. As he jumped over a hole again, she bit him in the groin. It was extremely painful, and he leapt up yelling and thrashed around, digging holes in the sand to cool off his wounds. And so, the bushmen believe, this was how every depression, every crack and cranny and riverbed in the landscape was formed. No doubt had the trickster been in what is today the northern Limpopo province, he might have broken rocks off the cliffs in his agony strewing them about the land, thus creating this vast, rugged and broken landscape. There are, however, landscape creation stories that persist to this day. The northern Sutu, for example, tell of Sechokotswa, the mountain builder. This legendary figure, together with his pack ox, delved great quarries in the landscape and lugged big chunks of rock and built the mountains and valleys you see here today. The human footprints and the bovine spur that are found on the rocky pavements or in shelters in the hills and mountains are believed to have been made long, long ago by Sejo Kotswa and his pack ox when the rocks were still soft. The traditional Bushmen lived by gathering felt foods and hunting large game animals or trapping smaller ones. The women generally gathered felt foods, a chore also shared by men. Women also brought in smaller animals to eat. It was an economy that required an intimate knowledge of the bush and of its animal inhabitants. Bushmen hunted and shot large game with bows and arrows and shared the meat according to strict rules. Bushmen are renowned trackers and they use poison-tipped arrows to kill their prey. This is the basic hunting equipment of the Bushman hunter. The bow, made of gruyere wood. And this is the 
quiver for arrows. Here's an arrow. This is the shaft. And this is where it goes hooks into the string. This area is called the length shaft. And this is the point. When they shoot this into the animal, the shaft falls off and this stays inside the animal. Um, the poison, which is a poisoned grub, which is squashed, the poison of that goes onto the back here. So the arrow will penetrate the animal, it will run through the bush and this back will fall off. Animal spur are of supreme interest to hunter-gatherers, as indeed they are to all hunters. They serve as a directory to read environmental conditions and phenomena. And from these traces, hunters may plan their strategy. This is Chikongo Muti. It's the largest spur engraving site in South Africa. And there are at least seven or eight different species of animal spur depicted here. For example, this is a giraffe spur. These are a number of different antelope spurs. And unfortunately, this has been irreparably damaged by vandals. Here we have another giraffe spur. an eland spur. And this here is an elephant spur. And of course these are not engraved to scale. Um, moving across here, this might be a pangolin track. could be a hippopotamus. This is a perfect waterbuck spur and next to it is the painting of a waterbuck. Many of these uh, smaller antelope tracks are very difficult to identify but this track might represent the spur of a sesame. Some rock art researchers have suggested that spur engravings were used for teaching young hunters to track certain animals. However, the arduous task of pecking or cutting images into hard rock surfaces for teaching aspirant hunters their trade seems highly unlikely because there would have been many tracks all over the immediate landscape. Spur inevitably evoke thoughts of hunting and tracking, activities that are both very practical and also highly symbolic. Although Bushman paintings depict real human and animal subjects, the meanings behind the images are symbolic. Each group of subjects within a panel, however literal they may appear to be to the viewer, is underlain by an idea, concept or belief. Bushman rock art is a religious art and depicts the interpenetration of the physical and spirit worlds. The delicate and frequently detailed Bushman fine line paintings were made using brushes made from twigs, quills, sticks or feathers. 
These are the paints that Bushman would have used. These two are red oxides and this is a white river clay. Now this is what colors they are. A lighter red and a darker red and then the white. These red oxides and white stone would be crushed in these grinding hollows and mixed with blood or plant sap uh, to act as stickers for the paint. In this grinding hollow you can see that there's the remnants of red pigment in it so that it's likely that these paintings in the shelter were made directly from this paint can as it were. The oldest southern African rock paintings date to about 27,000 years before the present. Most rock paintings of the Sokpansberg and Limpopo Valley, however, probably only date to the last 2,000 years. Samuel Dornan, an Irish Presbyterian missionary, recorded that some bushmen in the Limpopo Basin was still painting well into the early 20th century. Bushmen believe that people and certain animals bear supernatural potency which was given to them by God. This supernatural energy is particularly powerful in mega herbivores like giraffe, elephant and rhinoceros. Supernatural power is also borne by the large antelope that they hunt. Kudu, Hemsbok, Eland, Red Hartebeest and Tsesebe, for example, are especially potent animals and are widespread subjects in Southern Africa's rock art. Knowledge of the spirit realm is brought to people by shamans who have access to the domain of the supernatural. One of the central themes of Southern African Bushman art is that of the medicine or trance dance. This dance facilitates contact between the human and the spirit world and is substantially the same among different Bushman groups. Intimately connected to this dance is the idea of supernatural potency. Bushmen say that potency resides at the base of the spine and in the lower abdomen where it lies latent until activated by the rhythmic dancing and the singing of power songs by a woman at a medicine dance. The activated potency is said to boil and rise up the spine to the base of the head inducing deep altered states of consciousness. During altered states, the shamans are believed to be able to travel to the spirit world, cure the sick, control animal herds, and bring rain. The importance of this ritual in the past is borne out by explicit rock paintings all over Southern Africa. The giraffe plays a central role in the myth, ritual and religion of many Bushmen. The giraffe is a ritual animal whose marrow and urine are considered strong curative medicines sent by God 
to medicine people or shamans so that they may heal people. The markings on the hide of the giraffe are like rain clouds, some bushmen say. The power and supernatural potency of this animal is best exemplified by the giraffe medicine song sung by women at medicine dances in the Kalahari today. The giraffe song is considered to have been divinely revealed to the Kalahari Bushmen when, as anthropologist Megan Beasley records, a woman called Bay dreamt of a herd of giraffe galloping ahead of an approaching thunderstorm. The sound of the galloping hooves combined with the rhythm of the beating rain was the genesis of the giraffe medicine dance, which proved to be most efficacious in inducing trance during healing rituals. It soon spread across the Kalahari, where it replaced the older Hemsbok medicine dance. Sometimes the artists painted a complete medicine dance, with men dancing and women singing and clapping. They also painted things that only shamans could see on their journeys to other realms. To make things easier, we are using tracings to clarify the paintings you have just seen. These are the so-called Therianthropes, which are hybrids between human and animal figures. The body of a human and the head of possibly a dog represents the transformation that a shaman might undergo when he enters altered states of consciousness. This theory and throat carries two sticks and these sticks are used specifically in the medicine dance so that the shaman does not fall over when he begins to shake. This here is the red smearing and these red smears go straight through the abdomens of, of these shamans which suggests that this red pigment represents supernatural potency. Another feature is that these two have bleeding noses. During altered states, shamans often bleed from the nose. These two animals are kudu, as you can see by the corkscrew horns, a male and a female. Now the kudu are the most painted antelope in this part of the world. This is a crack or step in the rock face. And this animal appears to be coming out of the crack. So this is a spirit animal coming out of the spirit world, which lies behind the rock face. Here, we have more smearing across the abdomens of these people here. And that would also suggest that this is supernatural potency. Elephants are one of the most painted animals in northern South Africa. At the beginning of the 20th century, Samuel Dornan recorded that the Bushmen of the Limpopo Basin had an especially powerful medicine ritual, the elephant bull dance. This whole panel represents elements and segments of the medicine dance and it's dominated by this huge elephant with a red line down his back. These two giraffe and the elephant, the lines, this boat shaped image and this little image here are all Bushman paintings. This here and the dots 
are all quick quick paintings. Now these lines coming up around the boat shape go into a crack in the rock, goes up into another crack and then toward the elephant. These are called threads of light. These threads of light are experienced by shamans in altered states of consciousness and they say that they climb up the threads to God's village in the sky. And this is how they access the spirit world. Now these lines go into the cracks and this is entering the spirit world behind the rock face. Another feature of the medicine dance is this hunter here who has his abdomen pierced by arrows. When shamans are teaching aspirant trances to accept supernatural potency, they might snap their fingers and they say this is shooting arrows of potency into the abdomen of the aspirant trancer. Another feature is the red dorsal line on the elephant. Now this is believed to represent the supernatural potency moving up the spine of the elephant toward his head. This rather enigmatic image here, which has a castellated top, is believed to be a, an optic phenomenon which is seen when people go into altered states of consciousness. This is, these are, are called boat shapes or naviculars. These images are seen on the periphery of the vision when people are going into altered states and they pulsate with light. Another feature are these giraffes and giraffes are said to be filled with supernatural potency as is the elephant. Apart from Bushman art, there is a second tradition called geometric art. These paintings consist of finger dots and strokes, hand prints and geometric forms. These images were made using the finger and are predominantly red and white. These paintings are thought to have been made by the Kwekwen, also known as Khoikhoin, or in the past Hottentots. The Kwekwen coexisted for at least 1500 years with the Bushmen of northern Limpopo province. They were herders who, it is thought, originally introduced sheep into South Africa. They owned cattle and sheep, and their social organization revolved around their herding activities. The Kwekwe relied mainly on hunting wild animals and gathering felt foods, and stock would usually be slaughtered only on ritual and ceremonial occasions. Religious beliefs centered on two prominent deities. Amongst the Nama Kwekwe, the first was the creator god, controller of rain, and source of health and abundance. In contrast to this rather benign god, was an essentially evil deity who caused illness and death. Another important figure was a folk hero and sorcerer, the trickster god Haitziaibib, who had the ability to die and return to life. All over the landscape there are cairns, believed to be the deity's graves, where safe passage could be ascertained and good luck ensured by casting a stone onto the pile. The Kwekwe attached special significance to the moon, whose phases indicated the times for rainmaking rites and other ceremonies. Importantly, the Kwekwe held 
lavish initiation ceremonies for boys and girls. During these rites, the faces of the girls were decorated with dots and circles, and this is thought to be the origin of the geometric images in rock paintings. At puberty, new loincloths were given to boys and new aprons to girls, signifying their new adult status. Images of Kwekwe aprons form a small component of Kwekwe rock paintings. To illustrate this, we return to the Bushman painting of the elephant. These parallel lines of dots and the semicircles of dots are typical Kwekwe paintings. It is thought that these dots are associated with initiation rites. This image below the giraffe is a depiction of a Kwekwe apron and it lies underneath this Bushman giraffe. Yet a third rock art tradition is to be found in northern Limpopo province. Paintings and engravings made by Bantu-speaking men and women. Because the art is fairly recent and the people who live near the sites are only a few generations removed from the artists, it is possible to relate the symbolism depicted in the rock art to modern forms of ritual and art. The last phase of northern Sutu art depicts men with weapons and other images of war. This type of art records the northern Sutu struggle for independence from white domination in the late 19th century. This here, this animal, is typical of northern Sutu art, and it probably represents a cow. This little square one is the apron of a young girl, and it's called Tetwana. These here are probably representations of adult woman's aprons, the teto. And that one up there might be a woman's or a girl's apron. The cross motif on the apron itself is very typical of the decoration that is found on aprons. The big grid over there probably represents the, the front apron of a Sutu woman. Earlier phases of the art are linked to boys' and girls' initiation rites. Animal imagery, for example, is mainly associated with boys' rites of passage, and geometric images are linked to girls' initiation. This is a fine example of northern Sutu paintings. They are found all over the Sotpinsberg and to the west in the Machabeng Plateau. Interestingly, these are women's paintings. They are used as teaching devices during initiation. The meanings of these paintings, or rather the names of the images, were given to me by a northern Sutu woman and a vendor woman. Images that look like lizards or crocodiles are called koma, which simply means initiation. These crocodilian motifs are generally associated with fertility, but their function in initiation rites remain a closely guarded secret. Clouds of dots painted on the rock face are said to represent the white dots that are made on the bodies of female initiates during a certain phase of their rites. 
Solid red dots represent markings made with red ochre on the thighs of initiates. Two vertical strokes represent cuts made on the thighs of girls, which are then rubbed with medicines to ward off negative influences. Various phases of the moon are usually a feature of women's art. It is believed that the moon is directly linked to fertility. When the moon is full, women are most fertile, and the moon is also associated with rain. Depictions of female garments are another important motif in the art. Back aprons are represented by bifurcated triangular shapes resembling swallow tails, and the size and length of the apron indicates whether it is a girl's or a woman's back apron. Front aprons are depicted with rounded lower edges or as vertical rectangles. Another important motif is a horizontally elongated rectangle and this represents a wraparound bark skirt that is only worn by initiates. Generally, the depiction of female clothing indicates the various stages of life from girlhood through initiation rites to womanhood. Images of moon phases and aprons may be repeated as graphic designs in beadwork, ceramics and the wall decorations on northern Sutu homesteads, thus linking social relations to the well-being of the land. Throughout history, people have made art. In southern Africa, the making of rock art goes back over 20,000 years, testifying to the power of the image. All over the landscape, usually in well-hidden places, there are precious art treasures. These paintings and engravings illustrate the finer subtleties of the human mind and the way in which different peoples portrayed their most deeply held beliefs, their will to transcendence and important rites and ceremonies. The paintings of Bushmen, Kwekwe and northern Sutu peoples are frequently found in the same rock shelters and there is some overlap in subject matter which suggests that these three distinctive peoples influenced each other in various ways. These fragile images therefore speak of the interaction between different peoples in the last 2000 years, a situation which persists in our present day multicultural society. Although the Bushmen and Kwekwe of Northern South Africa are no longer with us, their art remains as a priceless heritage. <laughs>